So the Dene Mapping Project. In um, the 1970s, when the when a, a set of companies wanted to build a pipeline along the Mackenzie River Valley, um, one of the things that the Dene asked for was some money to be able to do some mapping so that they could show how much building a pipeline would affect their traditional hunting. Um, so the pipeline company's argument was couldn't possibly because a pipeline is like a thin strand of thread in a football field. So why would that make such a difference? So they said, no, we want to do this. But they had another reason, and a really important reason, and I think that it separated them from the others. I'm not sure whether Milton's project tried to do the same thing, but I do know the more recent mapping projects, I've not heard that they do that. And this was to educate the young people in the communities about the land when they don't go out on the land as much. So they chose hunters and trappers who were well respected and who used the land extensively, so many places as well as intensively, so that they could get they could get that image down. But then what they did, which was politically very, very, very wise was to have them do it publicly. And nowadays, the trapper goes into a, a room and he draws his lines on the map. Be it's between him and the cartographer, or the computer person. They did it differently. They put these maps on tables. They had them take a, a pen or a crayon and draw where they were going in, in a colored crayon and it tell people what was going on in different parts of those trails. And so the stories, the place names, all of that. Some of those were included at first, some of them they got later, but that's, that's how it was done. And do it in front of young kids so that they could hear the stories by doing it. And it became a political mobilization tool for people to really be very strong against building the pipeline. Okay, so then there we had these maps, and they were used at the at the uh, Berger inquiry, and they were put away somewhere. Then, as I said earlier, the government wanted us to demonstrate that we had land use in these areas, and so, um, and the communities wanted their maps back, so we decided that we would do this through a computer project. And that's what, that's what I talked about before. It took about two and a half years, people working on light tables with maps and drawing lines, uh, uh, com um, electronic lines, and then associating the lines with information about what was happening in those parts of the trail. And uh, yeah, after about two and a half years, we had all of this whole thing mapped. So as that map will show, anywhere on those lines, you point to any place, we can tell you what happened in those years on those lands. Yeah. Then they sort of got lost. And I was, I went to a meeting, CASCA meeting, and I was invited to sit in on a panel on the north, and they and the person who was organizing it asked me, "What about those maps? What did I think of those maps?" And I said, "I don't know. They've been lost. I don't know what what's happened to them, and it's one of my great disappointments." And one by one, these kids who work in the north took out their computers 
And they said, well, I have the one for the Gujin here. I have the one. For and I could see it. It was so wonderful to see that those maps were still there. So, yeah, that's the story. Yeah. How did Casca ever get started? Now, I don't know. Have you heard from other people? Anyway, it started with Sally Weaver. You know who Sally Weaver is? Okay. So Sally got really exercised, annoyed, depressed, unimpressed, angry, some combination of those words, at the CSAA, Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association, because the CSAA would not allow for any political expression. It was a professional organization, they said, and we cannot have resolutions about things and so on and so forth. And, of course, anthropology is the small end of the CSAA, so we didn't have much we could do to push back. So she said, let's start our own, where we will be free to do this. And we have to call it the Canadian Ethnology Society because they own anthropology. And we couldn't get the word back from them. So that's why it was called the Canadian Ethnology Society. And I was recruited as the Western, not BC, but Western, I think, maybe representative of the committee that was going to start this new organization. And I know we met a few times, but I remember one time in particular where we met in Les Beaumont, which was where Adé Tremblay had his family home, I think. Is, and he hosted it. And we spent two days working through what the provisions of it would be. It was a really amazing experience. I just want to say on the side, because Jim Friedman was a part of it, and I don't, you're probably not, I don't think you're interviewing him, are you? I don't know. November. Good. Well, I remember we're driving, we're driving, and people from Quebec will really appreciate this. We're driving out to Les Beaumont, and he says, and mind you, everyone in there speaks French, right? I mean, I'm the weakest, but everyone, this is, this is, this is a particular, because we're trying to make this kind of an organization. So, every, you know, we're, um, he says, I know what je me souviens is supposed to mean, but I don't understand what it means on the license plate. Huh? And we spent the whole trip <laughs> discussing what this meant. I'll never forget that. It was a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful occasion. Yeah. So anyway, we got that organized. We had our meeting. I remember one of the early meetings uh, talking with Pierre Miranda, who at that time was come really, as always, angry that there wasn't more in French. And I, I want to confess this, even though he's not around anymore. I said one of the stupidest things I'd ever say in my life to him, which is, was, let's just pass a resolution that next year half of the papers will be in French, as though that was going to solve the problem. But you see, at the time, because like I say, I have this passive, I only feel like I need to spend time listening and it'll be okay, but I didn't realize how many people that would not be helpful to us. Anyway, I apologize to him for having, having made that. Okay, so then I became president of the association, I think in 87, something like that. Do you have that down? I don't know. Somewhere, I, I have it down, but I think it's 87. Yeah, yeah. okay. So that was an interesting moment because that was the Calgary Olympics, the time of the Calgary Olympics, Winter Olympics. And the Lubicon Cree, whose lands are still being destroyed in the, 
by the tar sands in Alberta were in a big fight with Shell, which is one of the major producers, and they thought that one of the ways to put pressure on Shell was to attack them for sponsoring the Calgary Winter Olympics. And as part of that, to demand that all of the artifacts that were being brought in for the Calgary Winter Olympics be repatriated to indigenous communities. So it was a really like very big issue at that time, very big issue at the time. And the executive of the Canadian Ethnology Society passed a resolution supporting that. And there was a lot of the membership who got quite upset with that. Um, and one of the, I suppose, ironic things was that they said that the Canadian Ethnology Society was a professional organization and not a political organization, and we shouldn't be making political statements when that was the whole right reason that we had formed it. But anyway, that that led me to a, a very distant, very very distant. I stopped being a member. I stopped being involved in them with them for quite a while before I came back. Yeah, I th I thought that was really an, an unfair attack on people who are trying their best to, uh, to 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 figure out what you know what to do in a very bad political circumstance. And I'm an activist. Sorry, you elected me, and that's who I am. And I never was shy of that. So anyway, that's that one. The Department of Anthropology at the University of Alberta was only one of five departments in Canada, I think that includes French Canada, that had a PhD in 1971 when I first showed up there. It was a four field department and it still is in a classic American kind of tradition. Um, it was a very strong department, um, maybe not as well known as, as it might have been, but actually anything in Alberta, it's hard to get it known. But being on the inside and coming from the kind of place that I came from, you know, Columbia and Chicago, I you know what, uh, I have an experience of what, of what a good uh, department might be like. Um, it was a very good department and it suffered because it had too many stars which is a problem with really good departments. So Milton Freeman definitely was a star in the department. Linda Fedigan in physical anthropology was a real star in the department. Um, Owen Beatty, another physical anthropologist, uh, were really big star. Um, Alan Bryan doing that work on early man that's now proven to be so accurate, you know, big star. And Ruth, um, you know, we had, I, and I'm not covering everybody, and these are in each of the subfields. And two of the subfields require a heck of a lot of material resources. So it really put a lot of strain on the department as to what they were going to support and how they were going to support it. Um, we, we were mostly at the beginning, our biggest problem was that we were all too junior for the responsibilities that were placed on us. Um, I was hired in 1971 with three or four other people. And David Young, I think, was one of them. In an attempt 
to change the department, which was in deep trouble by hiring all these people to end the conflicts that were going on in the department. Um, but we couldn't, we had a hard time finding someone who was prepared to be chair. I mean, not emotionally prepared, I mean, was far and along enough in their career to be chair. So the person they first hired when I came on, Hank Lewis, he was good. He, he was able to be chair. So for the first period, it was fine. I think it was only three years. But then he didn't want to do it again. And then it was very hard. We found somebody, Rod Wilson, and he struggled. And then Cliff Hickey, and these are these are asso junior associate professors. I mean, we're no one's very far along with their career, and I think it affected him. And then I was the one after that, and I know it affected me, um, because here I'm at a time when I'm trying to be productive in terms of a career. Um, I became a full professor while I was chair. And not because I was chair, but because of my research. So it was it was very hard, and my family suffered. My relations with my family suffered greatly. Uh, yeah, and my own health and all of that. But we, we but we had to do it because we had no people to really show that senior kind of leadership. And yeah. Then after me, it went to an archaeologist, and anyway, um, yeah, it was very, di very difficult. And I, I was, was it? It was right after I was chair that I went to do this work with the Denny. So I, yeah, that's the sequence of it. And I became associate dean for a year, and I hated that. So I quit. I quit that, yeah. Anyway, I don't have much more to say about it, but I but the department has managed to uh, to maintain its its strength, I think. It's a good department. Um, but I don't have anything more to do with it. And intellectually I'm way closer even here, uh, to political science and I think my biggest intellectual engagements is with law, law legal people. I don't seem to have much engagement with anthropologists. I'm kind of strange that way. But I think I'm kind of a bizarre species of political theorist uh, who, uh, you know, but there's a little bit, but not, not that much, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, that's all I can say about that. Uh, that was uh, good enough. Good. Good. The man teaches courses. No. I, oh, I want to talk about one course. Okay. So I teach. It's true that when I came to the University of Victoria, I was teaching anthropological theory um, and social structures. I would have liked to teach it, but no one teaches it anymore. I don't know if, they, I hope they teach it at Laval, but um, as far as uh, I know, um, kinship is considered to be um, a useless topic that was made up by a bunch of white men for the purposes of, I don't know what, uh, playing games. But it has nothing to do with anyone's real life and it should be eliminated from the curriculum. At least that's what I what I hear. And since I think that that's the most important stuff that we have in the discipline, it's a great disappointment that I, I don't get to teach it. Um, but now that I, so when I got here, I found out that, first of all, I wasn't that, I wasn't as good as I arrogantly thought I was in my theory, my political anthropological theory stuff, when it comes to indigenous peoples. I, you read Home and Native Land, it is a good piece of work. It will stand up on it. So I'm not, this is not false modesty. I think it's a good, really good piece of work. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it and so on. I got here 
And this place, bar none, is the best place. Any of you people want to ever do this kind of work? This is the only place to come. On relations between indigenous peoples and settler states. This, these people here are the best theorists in the world, led by Jim Tully, who's a political philosopher who has written some amazing stuff, including a book called Strange Multiplicity, in which he talks really about how to accommodate all kinds of cultural diversity within a, within a, a system of citizenship relations that's not liberal, but is not filled with that postmodernist kind of obfuscations. It's really good, really good stuff. And he's deeply committed to this kind of kind of work. Um, he's just doing some stuff on Gaia citizenship in which he's trying to talk about how we can be environmentally cit citizens environmentally in relationship to indigenous people. Anyway, his stuff is spectacular and he's among the first rank of political philosophers. He's taught me a hell of a lot. He taught me a hell of a lot. And then there's um, Taike Alfred, who's a political philosopher, a Haudenosaunee guy, who's really strong. I mean, I don't agree with him on lots of things, but he sure taught me a lot about how to think about these issues and what, what my what problems to consider in, in being a settler and work, trying to work on this stuff. Um, I mean, I can name, you know, Jeremy Weber. There's, uh, I mean, I just keep on going. And I apologize if I didn't name you, because there's so many of you. Anyway, this place is, is the place in the world. And people come here from all over the world to do that kind of work. So I have benefited greatly from spending the time here. And at one point, I uh, think, they appreciate me too, especially in political science and law. And the political science department agreed to my request that I teach a course called Anthropology and Political Theory. Uh, anthropology as Political Theory. And I taught it first time with a political theorist. And I tried to show them how Radcliffe Brown and I have a particular fondness for an article called Patrilineal and Matrilineal Succession, which I don't know if you did you do know this article? No. no. Okay. It's written in 1935, 36. It's in a book called Structure and Function in Primitive Society, reprints of his articles about 1955. And it's the article that we were taught by Rossman and Rubel, um, was the groundwork for the notion of reciproc reci reci reciprocity in kin terms. If you call somebody by a certain term the reciprocal, they will call you by the reciprocal term, and about transmission of rights through lineages. Okay, And that's what it is. It's all about that. It's all about that. But the thing that I found after coming here and seeing how political philosophers deal with characters like Radcliffe Brown, who are they take seriously and they try to understand. And so they go and see, well, what did he write in newspapers? We don't do that. We don't do this kind of thing, appreciations of these people. What, were, what, were their, what was their position? So the best we did was Assad, Talal Assad, who complained that, Levy, that, sorry, that Radcliffe Brown was part of that handmaiden of colonialism group because he lived comfortably with colonialism because he worked in the colonial period. So I started to read, following this political philosophy stuff, his letters, his arguments, and so on. He was like a strong advocate for indigenous rights. And he hid it in this language of the times. But if you deconstruct this piece, you'll see that it's an argument against terra nullius, which means it's an argument that the Australian 
government had no right to claim sovereignty um, because these people were organized in political societies, and it's it's all in there. And he first published this paper in a law journal dealing with reform, legal reforms to reflect alternative ways of organizing property and so on. So, so this, yeah, so because I got here, I was able to start looking at stuff this way and it really, really helped me. So anyway, got the key to that course was going through the gift. Um, and um, making sense of the argument as an argument in political philosophy rather than in anthropology. Because in anthropology, it strikes me that the argument is about economics. It gets to be about economics and exchange. Whereas in political philosophy, it gets to be an argument about contract and um, and uh, the and its enforcement, because political philosophy, the Hobbes and so on, there, Hobbes is all about that we want to be able to do these nice things, like exchange with each other and so on, but we're constrained by the by the way in which the world really works that at the end of the day, we cannot trust each other sufficiently to make contracts unless there's a sovereign who imposes discipline on us so that we will fulfill the terms of the contract even when they're not in our interest. And Mouse is really struggling with that. That whole beginning, he says there's no such thing as a natural society. He says... Um, um, you know, he, he talks about the obligation to give as though this overcomes this inability to trust. Right? He's, really that he's really going directly at political philosophy. That's, that, that's what I... So that had a great effect. The class, the class loved it. So I started to teach that subsequently and I still and I'm still doing that now I, I, and and out of that I got the student that I mentioned to you who is uh, who is working on the whole question of uh, the relationship between uh, from a sovereignist perspective the relationship between Quebec sovereignty and indigenous rights without trying to resort to a state form and she's running it right through mouse and trying to work it out through that. And that's, I'm working on that right, right, that stuff right now. Anyway, I want to talk about that. Boy, that's what the one thing I want to talk about. Not for this, but just because I've got people here who are, who are, whose first language is French and who have got to have spent some time thinking about the difference between le cadeau and le don, surely, because it doesn't seem to be as much of that in the literature, and I don't know why, given that they mean such different things or can mean such different things. I've got, I've got people I can talk to about that. Can't wait to get finished with this one. Talk about that. <laughs>